<laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's compare answers for the homework, page 12. The first mistake is the very first word, things, no apostrophe. Things to do this week. A, call John's doctor and arrange for a release of annual medical report. B, check on last springs blood pressure numbers to see whether they need to be changed. C. Ask John about his rodent problem. By the way, a rodent is basically a rat. So ask John about his rodent problems means are there still rats in his house? D, find out why networks can't broadcast Tuesdays li uh, speech live as John needs primetime publicity. E, ask whether his Fondness for long speeches is a problem. F, send big present to network president and remind him that you are both Yale of 06. So last week we mentioned that the apostrophe stands for any omitted words, sorry, any omitted letters. In this case, the full number is 2006, so you have omitted the two and the zero. That's why you need the apostrophe here. G, order bouquets for Secretary and National Secretary's Week card. OK, so there is some debate about this one. If the day or the week is named after a job, like Teacher's Day, first of all, how many teachers? And secondly, is there a possessive or is it simply the name of the day? Um, I don't really care too much as long as we know what you're talking about. Like uh, Olivia Rodrigo has the song Driver's License, right? And she does she she uses a plural and no apostrophe. So it's a license for drivers. But you can also say that each license is for a single driver, so it should be singular apostrophe s, a driver's license, a license that belongs to a driver. Or you can say that it's a license for all drivers, so it's drivers, plural, apostrophe. I think all three work, so I'm going to leave this one. But you should know that there are three choices. Secretary's week could be like this, plural, no possessive. It could be plural and possessive with apostrophe. Or it could be singular, apostrophe s. So why? apostrophe S. I think all three choices are fine. H, rewrite speech on cat litter. Why is there an apostrophe here? No, no idea why. To reflect sister in law's ideas. Your sister in law is one person. So it's singular apostrophe S. But you should know that the plural of sister-in-law is sisters-in-law. The S goes in the middle. I tell opposing manager's assistant that you guys wouldn't 
stand a chance in the old days? Questions? OK, next page 13. Let's see. Uh, what does it want us to do? Replace with a few, few, a little, or little. OK. Number three. Many cities in the world have a population of over a million, and some cities have a population of more than 10 million. So the second number of cities should be smaller than the first number of cities. So it should be a few. Uh, number four, you might reach your goal if you put forth a little more effort. Effort is uncountable. Five, the professor lectured very clearly. At the end of the class, few students had questions. Number six, I have to go to the post office because I have a few letters to mail. Number seven, every day Max goes to his mailbox, but it is usually empty. He gets little mail. Mail is uncountable. You can say pieces of mail. You cannot count mail. Number eight, my friend arrived in the United States a few months ago. Number nine, I think you could use a little help. Let me give you a little advice. OK, but you should know nobody says let me give you a little advice. Everybody always says let me give you some advice. Or a bit of advice, but nobody says a little advice. And number 10, Margaret likes sweet tea. She usually adds a little honey to her tea. Sometimes she adds a little milk too. Honey and milk are substances and so they are uncountable. Questions? OK, next page. Page 14. Correct the errors. Not every sentence has an error. Great, thanks for telling us. Number one, according to the Constitution of the United States, every person, is that what it wants? One each every, yes. Every person has certain rights. Number two. One of one each and every. OK, so the error might not be related to might not be specifically the words one each and every, but there is something wrong. OK, number two, one of the rights. Is the right to vote. OK, this should be one of those rights. We're going to talk about this today. Number three, each of the states ha is represented by two senators in the US Senate. Number four, each senator. Now, some of you might be thinking, shouldn't it be every senator? I think each is a better answer, but you have to know about US government to know why. In Taiwan, when we elect legislative Ren, uh, representatives, each person serves for four years, and then they all have to do an election at the same time. In the US, each senator serves for six years, but they have elections every two years. 
So if so every two years, one third of the Senate will go through an election. So not every senator has to be elected at the same time. So I think using the word each, which means each separately, makes more sense in this sentence. Uh, the other choice is every. And also the question already has the word each. Uh, we should try to change as little as possible. Number five. The number of representatives in the House of Representatives depends on the population of. Each state, this one is correct. It's different states have different populations, so it should be each. Not every. Number six, for example, Nevada, one of the very smallest states has only three representatives, but New York, a populous state, has 29 representatives. Seven, every one of I'm going to say the citizens. So we're talking about all of the citizens as one group and every person in that group. So every one of the citizens is eligible to vote for president, but not every citizen, this is correct, exercises this right. The word exercise here just means use. And number eight, in some countries, voting is compulsory. Every citizen must vote. Questions? So I know this is grammar class, but we have to have something in order to see the grammar. And so whatever that thing is, I think it's a great opportunity to learn more words and to learn a bit more about the world. So if you do, there's something in the question that you don't understand, I encourage you to look it up and increase your knowledge. OK, next one. Correct the errors. Wide open possibilities. Number two, my cousin and her husband moved to another city because they don't like the cold weather. Number three. Oh, uh, some of you might be thinking. Can we just leave this blank? Can we just delete a they don't like cold weather? It makes more sense to add the because you are actually talking about the cold weather of their original city. That's why they decided to move. They don't like the cold weather here. A specific kind of cold weather. Number three, I like to travel because I like to learn about other countries and customs. Number four, collecting stamps is one of my hobbies. By the way, the name for collecting stamps is philately. It's one of uh, the least common words you will ever see. Philately just means stamp collecting. It's a noun. This word is probably the most useless word I will teach you. Number five. I came here three and a half months ago. I think I have made. Good progress. In English, you cannot count progress. OK, questions. OK. Next page, page 15. 
Some of the sentences do not contain any errors. OK, number three. The teacher gave each student. A test paper. Another way to answer this is each of the students. Both are correct. Number four, every student in the class did well on the test. Correct. Number five, Spain is one of the countries. I want to visit. Or you can say Spain is. One country. Or Spain is a country. I want to visit. Number six. Every piece of furniture, furniture is uncountable. In that room is made of wood. The reason furniture is uncountable is because it is actually an abstract noun. It is an abstract noun from the verb to furnish. To furnish means to fill with things to fill with what we call furniture. So if you furnish a room, you put furniture into the room. So the word furniture is uncountable. Number seven. One of the pieces of equipment. In our office is broken. Again, P, uh, equipment is uncountable. Number eight, I gave a present to each of the women. Ooh, women in the room. Number nine. One of my favorite places. In the world is an island in the Caribbean Sea. Number 10. Each one of your suitcases will be checked when you go through customs. This is correct. Number 11. It's impossible for one human being to know every language in the world. Number 12. I found each of the errors in this exercise. In OK, for number 12, I think this is the only answer. I would rather you not say each error because there is a specific group of errors. It says in this exercise. Uh, so you should have the the in, in the sentence. And if you have the the, then you have the of. So the best answer is I found each of the errors in this exercise. Questions? If I'm going too fast or there's a question you don't understand, please ask. Do you have questions? OK, next page. 16. Number one. That book contains. Many different kinds of story and article. Number two, in my country, there are a lot of schools. A lot is two words. Number three, she is always willing to help her friends in every possible way. Number four, in the past, horses were the principal means of transportation. Means, which means like tool or way, is habitually plural. Or I guess you should say, I should say the singular and the plural look the same. 
like sheep and sheep, fish and fish, means and means. Another one is, oh no, no, yeah, this one, means and means, both singular and plural are the same. Uh, or you, um, another way to answer this question is, the horse was, but also means is still wrong. Number five, he succeeded in creating one of the best armies in the world. Number six, there are a lot of. OK, there is a lot of. Equipment. In the research laboratory, but undergraduates are not allowed to use it. Number seven, I have a five year old daughter and a three year old son. Both of these words are adjectives, xionsi, and therefore cannot be counted. Number eight, most of the people in my apartment building are friendly. You wouldn't say your apartment's building because your apartment is your building. These are the same thing. Number nine, everyone seeks happiness in life. Which is not true. I, for example, do not seek happiness in life. I seek fame and success and being very, very rich. Number 10, writing compositions is very hard for me. This is one action. Writing is one action. Uh, gerunds cannot be plural. 11, almost all, okay, so this should be almost all of the students in my class are from Asia. I think all of the students in my class are from Asia. Yeah, okay. Number 12. It's difficult for me to understand English when people use a lot of slang. Slang is popular language uh, or informal language, and it is uncountable. Language is uncountable. Slang is uncountable. Dialect, Fang Yan, is also. No, no, no. You can count language, you can count uh, dialect, but you cannot count slang. Sorry. Questions? Yes. Yes. OK, so equipment is uncountable. So the, the problem with this whole sentence is that it treats equipment as countable and plural. So we have to change this to singular and change all of the related words to singular. OK, thank you. Other questions? OK. OK, that's it. That's for the homework. So today, we are going to talk about pronouns and then demonstratives later. Let's start with pronouns. There are basically two or three kinds of pronouns. The first kind of pronoun is called the personal pronoun, and it refers to concrete people or things. I'm sure you know all of these words. Think of it as a review. Uh, and for this, I'm just going to use the textbook because I don't want to spend time writing this thing. But I'm sure you know what this is, right? Ah,
I'm I'm sure you know what this is. So for the first person, if the subject is I, the, the object is me, the possessive pronoun, what is mine? This toy is mine. Uh, and the adjective is mine. So this is here just to give you comparison. We're mostly looking at these three today. Second person, you, you, yours is the pronoun. Third person, he, she, it, or one, him, her, it, or one, his, hers, its. But one, as a, there is no possessive pronoun for one. You have to rewrite. Um, I'll come back to the gender thing later because this is very important in English. Um, but for here, pay attention to not be confused. The pronoun and the adjective for his are the same, his, his. But for her is different. The adjective is her, but the pronoun is hers. And again, the possessive uh, adjective and pronoun for its is the same, its and its. So the main difference is between her and hers. This is her car. This car is hers. And then for the plural, first person subject is we, object is us, pronoun is ours. Second person, you, you, and yours. Third person, they, them, and theirs. Questions? I think this should be pretty basic, right? Okay, but we should talk about gender. Because in the third person, you have to choose. Each pronoun can only express one gender. So what if you don't know the gender of the person? Or you don't want to say the gender of the person? So for example, someone or got lunch. I hope not too hungry. Someone, is that a guy or a girl? We don't know. In the past, the rule was if you don't know, use masculine, use he. But as people started to realize, that kind of assumes that your average person is a guy. And that if it turns out to be a woman, then it would be a special case. And that doesn't seem very fair to women or to people of non-binary or third genders. So today, the answer is use they. They can be used for singular, non-specific gender. But the grammar is still plural. This is where it kind of gets confusing. Even if you're using they to refer to one person, the grammar is still plural. In English, we're used to thinking of the gender of a word fitting the gender of what the word refers to. If you're talking about a man, you use he. If you're talking about a woman, you use she. But this is not always the case. For example, there are some words in English that are feminine. Uh, for example, the name of a ship is usually feminine. Uh, for example, the, the Titanic took her last voyage. The her refers to the ship. Uh, another one is country, and you can remember countries because we have the word motherland. Uh, in Chinese, we call this mu guo, but there are exceptions. Some countries are thought of as the fatherland. And uh, usually countries that use the masculine pronoun and are called fatherland are connected to military culture, patriarchal culture, or communism in some way. So 
uh, traditionally we think of uh, Rome, the Roman Empire as a fatherland. We think of China as a fatherland. We think of, okay, this is going to get even more confusing. We think of Russia as the fatherland, but they also call it Mother Russia. So if you're not sure, just say it, because a country is not alive, you can say it if you want. But if you see somebody referring to the to a country using masculine or, or feminine words, now you know why. This kind of thing is uh, where the gender of the word is different from the gender of the thing. This situation is very, very common in European languages. Um, in fact, there was a study someone once did. Apparently, um, the French, I, I'm not sure about the details, but it's, it's something like the French word for bridge is feminine, but the German word for bridge is masculine. And so apparently French people think about bridges as elegant and beautiful, but German people think about bridges as strong and dependable or something like that. Um, so gender does influence the way you think about language. And all of this is probably very uh, unfamiliar to native Chinese speakers because Chinese basically doesn't have gender in language. Like we have the female version of her, right? But that's the only difference is in writing. In speaking, there is no difference. That was created in the early 20th century as a gesture toward feminism. Like we can't keep using the same word because that erases women, something like that. So they created a new word. And then of course the feminine version of you, right? Ni, nuzipana ni. It was an even later creation. But in terms of speaking, Chinese has no difference. Uh, but in English, every pronoun in the third person is some kind of gender. So while we're talking about gender, let's talk about titles. Sorry. For some guy you don't know, you call him Mr. Let's say Smith. What about this? What about two guys you don't know? By the way, Smith & Wesson is a gun company. So how do you say misters or how do you how do you abbreviate misters? Uh, we use the French. This technically should be monsieur plural with an S at the end. Um, but we borrow this from the French. In English, we call this misters, misters Smith and Wesson, two men. For women, if the woman is unmarried, we use miss. If the woman is married, we use Mrs. Smith. And in this case, uh, this is the name of her husband. You might think, well, that's kind of sexist. So uh, late, late in the 20th century, English came up with a new option. If you don't want to say whether the woman is married or not, you can use this. And in this case, her own name is Smith. This is, okay, so the first one, this is Miss. Therefore, this is Ms. Ms. Smith. So that way we don't have to say whether she's married or not. Uh, and then to be even more sexist, English also has this. Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. This refers to John Smith and his wife. And you often will only see this today in a wedding ceremony or in an invitation to a very official party. So we cordially invite Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, which means John Smith and then bring your wife. Um, 
I guess this is not a common enough situation for English to have to invent a new solution. Uh, but if you do feel it's too sexist, you can say like John and Mary Smith, and that basically solves the problem. Um, there is one very, very famous exception. You're not going to use this exception, but it's very famous. Uh, back in the day, Taylor Swift once dated a guy named Taylor Lautner, who played the werewolf in Twilight. Taylor Lautner later went on to marry a woman who's also named Taylor. And so uh, his wife took his last name. So his wife is also Taylor Lautner. So they are probably the only couple in history to be literally Mr. and Mrs. Taylor Lautner. So you're not going to use this, but I thought it was fun. OK, so that's that covers men and women titles. But what if again you don't know? Or you don't want to say the gender of the person, but you need to give a title. Well, recently there was a new invention. Mick Smith. And in this case, you don't even have to say whether Smith is a man, woman, or something else. Very inclusive option. But this is too uncommon to be uh, readily accepted by everyone. So if you do find yourself in the situation where you have to write this, I suggest restructuring your sentence. Write your sentence in a different way. Would be better. By the way, we're talking about Smith, right? The name Smith. Um, if you've ever read a story in English, or I guess even in Chinese, right? Like in Harry Potter, the protagonist's name is is always Harry, and then Ron is called Ron, and Hermione is called Hermione, but Draco Malfoy is called Malfoy. Severus Snape is called Snape. Why? Albus Dumbledore is called Dumbledore. Why do we use their last names? And this actually comes from uh, earlier in the 20th century. It was considered impolite to use somebody's first name unless you were very close with them. So like uh, I forget which movie, but at the end of one black and white movie, after the two leading men have gone through a great adventure together, finally one turns to the other and says, uh, you can call me John. Right? They finally like formally introduce themselves into a closer circle of intimacy where they allow the other person to use their first name. Otherwise, even for people you work with, even for people you go to class with, if you're not good friends with them, you should only use their last name. And that's why in the Harry Potter books, Draco Malfoy is always called Malfoy because Harry is not close with him. Um, so as the example shows, even today in literature and in written language, like a newspaper report, people will always be referred to by their last name after we meet them for the first time. So uh, it might say uh, John Smith was a witness to the accident. But in the next mention, it might call him Mr. Smith, or it might even just call him Smith. And you're supposed to remember who that's talking about. OK, that was a very long sidebar. So let's come back to pronouns. These are personal pronouns. We also have impersonal pronouns where you don't talk about a specific object. And these are easy to remember because it's every, uh, some, and any, plus one for people, and thing for things. And then you also have uh, nothing is the last one. 
all of these words are singular. All of them are singular. Even someone, something is also singular. In this case, some does not mean a few. Some means unspecific. Uh, and if you speak British English, you also have this choice. No one is one word, but in American English, it is two words, no hyphen. So everyone, everything, someone, something, anyone, anything, nothing. And then no one, two words in American. Questions so far? OK. Those are the. Oh, oh yeah, one more. Sorry, there's one. There's another word we have to talk about one. Haha. So it says here you can use one in the third person. One is just means unspecific. Sorry, in the subject position, one is uns uh, is an unspecific person. One just means a person. But in the object position, there you see this asterisk. That's because one is very special as a pronoun in the object position. Previously, we talked about words like so and do, right? So we have sentence like, um, he will go have lunch and I will do so too. So in this case, do stands for have, so stands for the idea of having lunch. They're not technically pronouns. Sometimes there's not a one to one connection, but they do stand for something. The word one in object position is used the same way. She has a car. And I have one too. So here the word one stands for a car. Um, so it's not a pronoun that you can use any time. You must have an antecedent. OK, and then finally we have the, the reflexive pronouns. Uh, let's see. My, your, sorry. Our, your, his, no, him, her, it, plus self. Myself, ours. Okay, that's a really bad way to write this. Myself, himself, herself, itself, or our, your, them, selves. Sorry, that, that's the correct one. Um, there are two places to use the reflexive pronoun. One is when your object is the same person as the subject. So, I told myself to be brave. In this case, the object is the same person as the subject, so you must use the reflexive pronoun. The second case is uh, emphasis. I myself haven't finished my homework. So in terms of grammar, you don't have to use this myself. This is emphasizing I'm talking about me. So the context would be like, I reminded my classmates to finish their homework, but I myself haven't finished my homework. You're emphasizing the, the my part. And then you have set phrases like by yourself, by myself, by themselves, which means alone, on your own. Now, uh, we mentioned that 
if you use they to refer to one person, it should still be plural. So someone. Uh, hurt themselves on the playground. By accident. In this case, this is one person, but because them is a grammatical plural, we still use selves. You will sometimes see somebody write something very strange like themselves. This is wrong. OK, those are the pronouns. Do you have questions? OK, let's take a short break and when we come back, we'll talk about demonstratives. Demonstratives are. Uh, let me give them to you now so you know what we're talking about. This, these and that, those. So that's after the break.
I do have an announcement uh, that I think is quite important. If you look at the syllabus, it says that week 16 is a movie and week 17 is a mock exam. But I was thinking, wouldn't it make more sense to do the mock exam first and then let you have an extra week to prepare for the final exam? Yeah, what do you think? Should we switch week 16 and week 17? I'll give you four seconds to think about it. OK, if you want to switch 16 and 17, watch a move, uh, do the mock exam first and then watch a movie second. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. OK, thank you. If you want to keep it this way, watch a movie first and then do the mock exam second. Raise your hand. OK, we're going to switch. Um, I should also have told you the mock exam does not count for points. It's pure practice. The grade does not matter. OK, so week 16 is the mock exam. Week 17 is the movie. Great. Thank you, everybody, for your opinion. Let's get back to whatever we were just doing. Demonstratives. OK, so here's the thing. These four words have the same meaning as the, but they are different in terms of location or in terms of significance or importance. This is singular, these is plural, that is singular, those is plural. The difference is that this and these are close. This context, you're talking about them right now. That and those are far away, a different context. You were talking about them before, somebody else was talking about them, or you're going to talk about them later. You're going to deal with them later. So this and these are close and right now, that and those are far away and later or by somebody else or another time. And that's the basic idea. Um, there are, is um, one specific rule that is related to these words, which is that only that and those can uh, become part of the phrase those of us um, or that of somebody. And this is related to pronouns. So like this, these, that, those, these four words can all be pronouns and they can be adjectives. So for example, um, I actually I should flip this. Adjectives first and then pronouns. We're going to talk about adjectives later in the semester. Um, so wait for that. So for example, uh, this book, this is the adjective. Or you can say, just say uh, this as a pronoun. So like, uh, I like this book. But you can say I. This. Like. That book, but I. Like this. Or. This this one would be an adjective, but I like this, right? So in this case, that is an adjective and this is a pronoun. All four of these words can work like this. But you then you can say things like uh, English is easy for those of us who have studied grammar. 
right? So only with that and those can you have an of phrase. So just like every one of us or any one of us, the of us gives you a group. And those tells you where the group is. So uh, the word that works in a similar way. Um, I know the name of Taylor Swift's boyfriend, but I don't know that of my sister. So in this case, the word that is a pronoun for name. Right? I don't know the name of my sister's boyfriend. You can omit the repeated boyfriend. So this only works for that and those. You cannot do this for this and these. What you can do with this and these is add the word one as a pronoun. As we're mentioning, uh, one in the object position refers to something that was talked about earlier. So, I finished that book and then started this one. So in this case, um, one is functioning as a pronoun that re replaces the word book. And then you can also use the word these like this. It's less common unless you're speaking British English, but it still works. I don't like those burgers, but I do like these ones. Also works, but in, but you know, if you're doing this, you might as well just say these. There's no real reason to say these ones, uh, but it is a choice. So if you do see it in the wild, you should know that it is correct. OK, so those are the demonstratives. It seems pretty straightforward, but the key is to grab the context. Which context counts as close? Which context counts as far? Uh, is sometimes not easy to determine. But this is the idea. Questions? OK, if you don't have questions, let's do some practice. Page 17. Correct the errors in pronoun usage. Uh, six questions, I'll give you three minutes.
Okay, let's compare answers. Number one, my friends and I, oh, I should talk about, I'll talk about this later. My friends and I ordered Indian food at the restaurant. I wasn't very hungry, but I ate most of it. Food is uncountable. Number two, when we were in school, my sister and I, okay, I'll talk about this now. So here's the thing. When you make a list with a pronoun, it should always, in the subject position, put I last. But in the object position, put me first. Nobody really cares about this anymore, but this is the correct order. If you have more than one subject and I is one of the subjects, put I last. If you have more than one object and me is one of the objects, put me first. OK, so number two is my sister and I used to play tennis after school every day. Number three. Oh, wow. How, what kind of mistakes do we have? OK, if you want to pass your exams, you had better you had better study very hard for them. Exams, plural. Number four, a hippopotamus. Spends most of its time in the water of rivers and lakes. Number five. Oh, OK, I should also say if you know the animal's gender, you should use the gender. So like. Um, some animals have different names for different genders. Like. Uh, I can't think of one right now. Like, uh, OK, this is going to be another very rare thing that you probably won't get to use. But a goose is actually feminine. And the name for the masculine is a gander. I previously said that the most useless thing I will teach you today is philately. I was wrong. This is the most useless thing I will teach you today. So if your sentence uses the word gander, you can use the masculine pronoun afterwards. There are other better examples that I can't think of right now, but some animals have different names for masculine and feminine. Number five, after work, Mr. Gray asked to speak to me and Mona about the company's new policies. He explained it to us and asked for our opinion. And number six, my friends asked to borrow my car because theirs was in the garage for repairs. Questions? OK, moving very quickly to the second half. Uh, the first paragraph has four errors. The second paragraph has 12 errors. And the third paragraph has 13 errors. Nouns and pronouns. So not limited to noun, uh, not limited to pronouns, anything related to nouns. So how many errors is that? 16, 29. Uh, this doesn't look too long. I'll give you five minutes. Wait, 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 I forgot. This is smaller. Uh, so I'll give you 10 minutes.
me more time? Time raise your hand. Take your time. Okay, let's compare answers. Paragraph one, 
potatoes are grown in most countries. They are one of the most widely grown vegetables in the world. They are very versatile. They can be prepared in many different ways. Number two, French fries are popular almost everywhere. Besides frying them, you can boil or bake potatoes. I'm going to say the potatoes. Because you're talking about a specific group of potatoes. You're talking about the potatoes you use to make French fries, these potatoes. Another way people use potatoes is to make potato flour for bread and other kinds of dishes. It's also possible to make alcoholic beverages from potatoes. There are still other ways potatoes are used by commercial food processors to make products such as potato chips and freeze-dried potatoes. Number three, the potato originated in South America, where it was cultivated by the Incas as early as 5,000 years ago. Another possible answer is to use the plural for both potatoes, and uh, this would be they were. Uh, years ago. It is believed that potatoes were the world's first freeze-dried food. Over 4,000 years ago, the Incas carried their harvest, sorry, harvested potatoes up into the mountains and spread them on the ground to freeze overnight. The next day, after the sun came up and heated the potatoes, the Incas squeezed the water out of them by stepping on them. This process was repeated for four or five days until almost all the moisture was gone from the potatoes. The Incas then dried the potatoes and stored them in pots. It should be more than one pot, right? You probably can't fit all of the potatoes into one pot. So sport stored them in pots. And then the Indians of South America still do this today. Questions? Do you have some questions? OK, let's move on to the next set. Page 18. Ten mistakes may be related to singular plural, gender, clarity, and confusion. That doesn't help very much. OK, ten mistakes, right? So I'll give you four minutes.
Okay, let's compare answers. Dear Mr. Baker, it's, which means it has, come to my attention that the watch you looked at yesterday in our Central Avenue store is broken. The band is disconnected from the watch, which is quite valuable. There is no record of payment beyond a very small amount. The clerk, Mr. Sievers, told me that you paid him exactly 1% of the watch's price. When you and your brother left the store, Mr. Sievers was still asking for additional funds. He, okay, this should be his, his blood pressure still has not returned to normal levels. <laughs> Frankly, I do not care who. So who is who's to blame for the broken watch band or Mr. Sievers's medical problem? I simply want it fixed. The watch and it, its band are not your property. The store needs its merchandise in good condition. Is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Am I missing two? OK, let's do this without the accent. Dear Mr. Baker, it's come to my attention that the watch you looked at yesterday in our Central Avenue store is broken. The band is disconnected from the watch, which is quite valuable. Ah, OK, so one, okay, the one hint is confusion. So here, which? What is which referring to? Is it talking about the watch or is it talking about the band? I'm going to say it's talking about the watch. The band is disconnected from the watch. Let's let's correct this to and the latter. We already have a, a comma and the latter is quite valuable. Joseph the second one. There is no record of payment beyond a very small amount. The clerk, Mr. Sievers, told me that you paid him exactly 1% of the watch's price. When you and your brother left the store, Mr. Sievers was still asking for additional funds. His blood pressure still has not returned to normal levels. Frankly, I do not care who is to blame for the broken watch band or Mr. Sievers' medical problem. I simply want it fixed. The watch and its band are not your property. The store needs its merchandising. Huh. I, I only found nine. Did anyone find a tenth mistake? Very interesting. OK, I'll look into this uh, later and I'll tell you if I find another mistake. Uh, I'll tell you next week. But currently we find nine. OK, yeah, OK, so let's uh, go to the next page. 20 pronoun errors. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you five minutes. Actually, do you guys want to do this one at home? Okay, I'll let you guys do this one at home. So homework, page 19 to 21, three pages. 
And next week, we are going to talk about descriptives, numbers, adjectives, and adverbs. And then week 14 will be prepositions. Week 15 will be punctuation and typing. 16 is the mock exam. 17 is the film. And then 18 is the final exam. Questions? All right, see you next week.